Another year gone. And thank God. There's been a chockload of stupid this year. Mostly you'll find it on Twitter. <coughs> or recently on YouTube. <coughs> but not here. Not here. Definitely not. And I definitely beseech you to join us today because for any fandom-based channel on YouTube, well, we seem legally obligated to deliver our top tens or our best of of the previous year. And you know what? It's understandable why. I mean, after all, you tune in because you, I hope, agree with what I have to say. And I love hearing about what you have to say. With that, I offer Narcotic Casserole's best of of 2017. Now, to change it up, I know most other people are going to do their top 10 list or something like that, but frankly, when I thought about it, I just did not want to pigeonhole a bunch of great stuff into just a slot of 10 and potentially leave out a lot of great films that deserve a lot, the equal amount of attention. And if you've been keeping up with all the reviews we've done this year, yeah, there's been a lot that definitely deserves recognition. So I decided that I'm going to do this in a award show format. Yes, there's going to be a lot of ones mentioned here that I have not done reviews for. In fact, I only started doing reviews on Narcotic Casserole back in May with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I only point that out because there will be some films mentioned here that I have not done reviews for, but yet I feel deserve an equal amount of recognition. Let's get started. We all have that film that we know for a fact is not the best in the world. Matter of fact, uh, much like, well, Krispy Kreme donuts, they are not good for us. This is a film based on a series that I watched like anyone else of my age just because, well, I was going through puberty and Kimberly and Trini were hot. I had no expectations for this movie, and yet I found myself oddly endeared by it. I actually found all the characters very interesting, very appealing, and it was nice the license they took to it to actually make the characters more than just the cardboard standees that they were in the original TV show. I still think about it with fond reverence, and not to mention I'm sorry, Krispy Kreme, you don't deserve product placement that good. This is the movie that didn't blow my mind, but at the same time didn't make me go, oh, what the hell? This is the film that I walked out of going, you know what, that was actually really good, I really enjoyed it, and I'll probably watch it again given the opportunity, but it didn't change my life. And that one was... Yes, a lot of the plot is a bit of a muddle, but nevertheless, you don't care because the cast are so game, the writing so sharp, and Kenneth Branagh's direction is very confident and has an absolutely wonderful edge that made this unique in the ever-growing pantheon of adaptations of Agatha Christie's work. It really was difficult to choose this one, but when I thought long and hard about it, I felt good. And so my winner is... Okay, okay, yes, I know, I know. I know Wonder Woman was excellent, and I know Thor Ragnarok was a blast. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that pushed it over the cliff for me. First off, Wonder Woman, yes, it's a wonderful movie, but in the end, it was just another superhero movie, even to the point that the ending was pedestrian and, frankly, unremarkable. Thor Ragnarok, which was an utterly wonderful romp, but here's the thing, there are moments in that movie which frankly should have felt a lot more emotionally resonant and tonally the film felt a bit lopsided. That's not a detriment to the film, but it was something that kind of pushed it out of the, out of the, head, the running for me. Spider-Man Homecoming, on the other hand, this film had the best balance. It had an excellent, unpredictable plot, particularly when you get to the revelation of who the Vulture actually is. You had a wonderful concept, one that lent itself to the hero. Of course, by that, I'm talking about the high school movie concept, which, frankly, showed us a part of Spider-Man which was only alluded to in previous outings, and we finally got to see it in full swing here, and it was excellent. It took us a while to finally get this Spider-Man movie that we can truly say is a great Spider-Man movie. And when you walk out of this film and you're going, I cannot wait to not only see Spider-Man again in his own movies, but I can't wait to see what he does in the MCU. The fact that we're at that point where we can say that now is an amazing thing. The winner of Best Action Movie and Best Actor in an Action Movie goes to... Whoa. John Wick, Chapter 2. Now, usually, whenever it comes to action sequels, the compulsion is always to go bigger, and that's fine. But the thing is, it, even when you go bigger, you still can fall into the trap of giving us exactly the same thing when it comes to story and when it comes to character. But John Wick Chapter 2 did not at all. And the one thing that definitely made it work 
much to everyone's surprise, was this incredibly layered performance by Keanu Reeves, an actor that only just a couple years prior was lambasted for his limited range. Everything about it builds on everything that was accomplished in the first one. We get to see how much bigger this fraternity of assassins goes. So much more that we find out about this organization called the High Table. We find out that there's this whole network and it is excellent and it's intriguing. And for extra measure, this film ends on a note that makes you not want to, not want to end. And you hope to God that there's going to be another one. And thank God there is. The winner is... Charlie Theron, Atomic Blonde. The film, plotting-wise, is a bit of a muddle, but the thing that carries it all the way through is the utterly electric performance of Charlie Theron as this double agent spy. It is an absolutely riveting watch. And, of course, the film is made by the same team responsible for John Wick, and I will tell you, it shows. And like any actor or actress, yes, they have to rely on stuntmen, but sometimes in order to maintain the realism of the scene, you gotta see the actor or actress doing it. And Charlize Theron, there is little doubt that she's doing a lot of the work in this movie. There is an incredible stairway brawl sequence, which is absolutely animalistic. And the thing is, normally, it's a scene that's usually reserved for male hero characters. And here's Charlize Theron absolutely killing it, both literally and metaphorically, and absolutely looking wonderful doing it. And even better, even when there are times where she just looks like she's had the absolute hell beat out of her, she still conveys the grace and, and poise and absolute intensity that the character requires. With all the excellent franchise films that came out this year, unfortunately there was one category that was pretty much lacking. Amidst all the nut job twos and the emoji movies, there really were only three animated films that were worth mentioning. Lego Batman, Your Name, and the winner is Coco really was a film that I didn't have much in the way of expectation for, particularly because we had movies like Book of Life that came out a couple years prior. This is probably some of Pixar's best since Up, and that is insanely high praise if you know Up. The story is equally as emotional, and while Up pretty much kicks the hell out of you in the first 10 minutes, this one is able to pepper all those really strong emotional moments consistently all the way throughout. It has such strong moments when it comes to all of our fears, when it comes to how we're remembered after we pass off this mortal coil. We all have fears about being forgotten. And this film actually kind of shows how sad it can be to be forgotten. And it's funny because Inside Out tackled it to an extent, but this one, took it a step further. On a visual level, on a storytelling level, and even on a musical level, Coco is the clear winner this year for Best Animated Film. <laughs> Most films usually tend to ride on the shoulders of one or even two main actors. However, it can be said that a lot of times it's all on the shoulders of an entire cast. And really, if there's one weak link, the entire thing falls apart. And with all honesty, with much consideration, there has not been an ensemble cast that electrified me and invigorated me with the level of the kids from... Yes, a lot of people have made comparisons to Stranger Things when it comes to It. Hell, one of the kids from Stranger Things is in It. You can compare all you want, but in the end, this is still an incredible array of kids. There are still bad kid actors out there, so it still took a great amount of attention to casting in order to make sure that not only are all these kids great actors, but the fact that they can work together cohesively. And considering the mature, dark, grim, and even horrific material portrayed in this film, you had this cast of kids who play it to the hilt. And for that, best ensemble of the year. Get out. Oh, no, 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 I forgot the lead in, forgot the lead in. You see, Get Out is an absolute surprise. Well, firstly, it blew everyone's minds because it was written and directed by one of the best comedic minds working right now, Jordan Peele. No one expected that he would write one of the most profound horror films in recent decades. It, yes, it works as a horror film, but it also works as a satire. It also works with the humorous elements that are in there, and there's some very strong drama happening within as well. Some of the best horror films are like that. And all this would mean nothing if the lead actor didn't pull his weight. And you know what? Daniel Kaluuya, he 
pull it off big time. Immediately when you meet him, he is likable, he is engaging, and when you see him go down this rabbit hole, you are genuinely worried for his welfare. And what's wonderful, because the screenplay is so deft, you have absolutely no idea what's going to become of it. You don't know if he's going to come out of this alive because the best part about horror is that it can go one way or the other. Some of the best horror films have gone south and some of the best ones have even worked out. But it's always intriguing where it goes. And you know what? Get Out did not disappoint on that front. Since we're on the subject of films with provocative themes, well, I wanted to point out a film that was, well, let's face it, the most provocative, or even in a better way to put it, most divisive. And for that, I'm gonna say... <laughs> you thought I was really gonna say Last Jedi? Yes, I know, there are a lot of people hating on Last Jedi right now, but you know what? A lot of people hated on Empire back when that first came out too, so give it time and people are gonna start warming up to Jedi. No, if there's a film that came out this year which pissed a lot of people off, even the people who you'd think would have been totally on board with this movie, oh no, the winner of that is... Oh yeah, how quickly we forget the film that pissed off so many people. It pissed off people for a variety of reasons. For all the film snobs, they thought that the symbolism was pretentious, ham-fisted. And then you got the, the regular film going public who went to go see it, and they were pissed because they thought it was going to be a horror movie, and then it turned out to be this parable, which ended up being a parallel to the fall of man. No one, no one could agree on what they truly felt about this movie down the line. It's not on video now. There are a lot of people who are watching it in the midst of all that, and now looking at it going, oh, okay, it's not as bad as all that. It definitely got the critical praise, it definitely got the audience praise, it did not get the box office praise, and it's really a shame because there was a lot writing on it too. And in fact, in order to get it, we got back one of the best filmmakers of our age. Of course, I'm talking about... We've seen heist movies before, we've seen heist comedies, but the thing is, this film still had a lot of heart to it. It had a great cross-section of characters. It's infinitely funny, consistently all the way through. Yes, there are a bit of pacing issues, but you don't care because the characters are so much fun, because the heist is so engaging, and because you have an absolutely wonderful setting, which really you don't get in this particular genre of film. And it is a damn shame that it did not get the box office draw. You look at this cast, these people usually make box office gold. Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, freaking Daniel Craig, and all these people were wonderful in it. And yet, somehow, someway, this film didn't get the appreciation it deserves. Well, it's out on DVD now. Go see Logan Lucky. Now, since we talked about a great film that got that went underappreciated, let's talk about a really crap movie that got loads of appreciation. And by that, I'm talking about The Room. And the reason why I'm talking about The Room is because... Of course, I'm talking about... You are tearing me apart, Tommy Wiseau! Never would you ever fathom that the worst film to come out of this century would spawn this insane cult following followed by an amazing book by Greg Sestero leading to this incredible fan base including some of the most prolific actors and filmmakers of our age and yet from all of that we get one of the funniest, one of the most emotionally poignant, and one of the most rewarding cinematic ex experiences of the year. James Franco's performance as Tommy Wiseau is utterly wonderful. Franco found all the levels to make Tommy Wiseau a tragic character, but also at the same time a humorous character. But even at the same time, he had no problem finding times to make him a very, well, hard to approach person. This was probably one of the most bravest biopics I've seen in a long time. Whether or not any of this can be taken as it actually happening, you don't really care. Because what you see here all leads to a parable of the strength of never giving up in your dreams, even if you don't have the talent, even if you don't have the experience. What matters is that you have the passion and the drive. You can still give something to the world that may not be great, but at least it's unique. <laughs> Let's talk about a comedy about a woman grieving over her dead daughter. Yeah, I know, barrel of laughs, right? 
Francis McDormand for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. This film is incredibly funny, and I'm definitely going to say that, but it is also incredibly sobering and incredibly haunting. Francis McDormand carries this all the way through. And here's the remarkable thing. She has no problem showing the character being at her most unlikable. And that says a lot when normally in a film like this, your goal is to have you sympathize with this person. And while you definitely can, you see this character go, go and do some pretty stupid stuff. Stuff that would make you go, because of Frances McDormand's very layered performance, it is absolutely unforgettable. And it's definitely one of the ones that stayed with me throughout the year. And I'm very happy to call it the best performance by an actress in a comedy. Well, yes, I did praise Spider-Man Homecoming as the best superhero film of the year, and I stand by that. That being said, we've seen Hugh Jackman play this role for 17 years, and never have we seen him play it with such raw emotion. There are still times where I think long and hard about this movie. You can tell that this was the story that Hugh Jackman, not only did he want to tell, and not only did he want to portray in this role, but it's also the one that he wanted to go out on. And you know what? Mission accomplished. Newcomer Daphne Keene in the role of X-23. Going back to what I said about It, it is really hard to find really great child actors, and I don't know where we're getting them nowadays. Whoever's been training this child to be able to play this feral kid, I can't even begin. And she is absolutely hypnotic all throughout. A long time ago, it was said, never work with kids or animals. Well, you know what? I think we can finally reduce that to just animals because the kids that are coming out of the woodwork nowadays, this girl in particular, holy hell. She is a new face with incredible talent and I wish her the best. And well, my way of doing it is giving her this award. Now, you think that with all the superhero fare, with all the war films, and even the occasional Star Wars, you'd think that any of them would be the prime candidate for best special effects, best motion capture performance, and even best villain. Well, guess what? That honor is held by another film, which was another franchise film that came out in the summer, but yes, still continues its string of excellence in its technology and its ability to convey raw emotion in CGI characters through actual performance on a soundstage. And for an extra bonus, we got an incredible multi-layered villain character performance. And for that, the winner is... Andy Serkis is the absolute pioneer of motion capture technology. We've seen it all the way back to Lord of the Rings, through King Kong, all the way to now. And even now, he's a consultant for other films that do motion capture work. And his work in this one is the absolute pinnacle of achievement for this particular field of acting. And it is an absolute disservice to his efforts that there is still not awards consideration for this type of acting. Woody Harrelson's performance, normally in any other film, this character would be just the general antagonist character who just wants to kill everything that's not him. But yet, his motivations are not what you expect. And even the resolution to his character is, again, not what you expect. And all of that portrayed with absolutely unflinching dedication by Woody Harrelson. This is this guy is amazing. He has come so far from playing the dunce at the bar in Cheers. It is incredible to see how far he's come, even when he plays roles that maybe in the hands of any other director or any other actor would have come off as one note and unmemorable. He was able to find that core and make him a menacing villain. Now, yes, yes, I know motion capture technology has indeed made great strides, but that does not mean prosthetic work and makeup is obsolete, particularly not when we get films such as the winner of Best Drama, Best Actress in a Drama, and Best Prosthetic and Makeup Work. That win goes to... Guillermo del Toro is back again. No one else can deliver the tale of a mute woman's romance with an amphibious man not like the way he could. He's the only one I know who could deliver a story such as this with exceptional grace and discipline. 
And it's not just him either. It is also the very layered performance by Sally Hawkins. It's been a long time since I've seen any film feature a mute woman and have her take center stage on this entire thing. Not since Samantha Morton and Sweet and Low Down. This one beats that in spades because this is Sally Hawkins having to show her vulnerability and her emotional attachment to, of all things, an amphibious man. Because of the technical wizardry of the makeup, of the prosthetics, we are able to see him reciprocate that sentiment to her. And only Guillermo del Toro could have conveyed that and make this one of the most unique romances in recent memory, and definitely the best dramatic romance of this year. So before we get to pretty much the last win, which won a lot, I'm gonna get this out of the way. I don't care for this movie. Ooh, wow, okay, it all comes down to this, and you know what, I'm glad I did it in this format, because if I kept praising this film consistently throughout the special, you would have said, what's the point? I would have gone on all day. This film is the best of 2017 to me, and that is... <laughs> this film should have been a basic cash grab. The rationale that the studios probably have for greenlighting it is because there was some niche demand to have this film come out, but no. Everyone was on board to make this just as unique and just as striking and just as quintessential as the original film. Denis Villeneuve is a director of considerable pedigree, and Lord knows, in the hands of any other director, they would have felt beholden to try and make this film feel like Ridley Scott's original. And while it definitely feels like a sequel to Ridley Scott's original film, this still feels like Denis Villeneuve's film. You would have thought that anyone involved would have just brushed this off as such, but everyone involved gives it their beyond what any kind of people approaching a Blade Runner sequel would have ever thought of it. Roger Deakins, one of the most underappreciated cinematographers in the history of film, and I say underappreciated because the guy has done incredible work four decades and he still has not gotten any kind of awards recognition. Well, he'd better get it this year. There is no contest. I've seen some beautiful films, but nothing comes close to how gorgeous Blade Runner 2049 is, so he'd better get it this year. It actually builds on concepts of the idea that while we as humans create life, even though it artificial it may be, what is the possibility that that life may in turn start to give life on its own? And that creates brand new questions which, while has been potentially explored in other films, but not to this level, to the point where it actually affects characters from the previous films to a very striking emotional level, but to see it affect characters, new characters, in introduced here. And it's by that rationale is why I give Harrison Ford Best Actor in a Science Fiction. We've seen him re-adopt roles from his past. We've seen him do Indiana Jones again. In my opinion, did great. He did Han Solo again. Also, in my opinion, did great. Even beyond the roles that made him famous. I have never seen emotive acting like this from Harrison Ford. Beyond his performances in even films like Frantic or Witness, I've never seen him go to the levels he goes to in Blade Runner 2049. And this is a role that back when he did the first time gave him all nine levels of hell. You'd never think that he would A, come back to this role, but B, deliver it with the same level of conviction that he did with the first one. Ana de Armas as Joy. Again, we've seen performances where an actress plays some kind of artificial intelligence who has the capacity to feel. A most recent example, of course, is Scarlett Johansson and her performance in Her. But that was just merely a voiceover. Whereas this is a person who is a companion to a replicant. And the replicant himself is experiencing the emotions of love. And through him, she ends up starting to develop those similar feelings. And it all hits home the central theme of the idea of life progressing, even if it's an artificial construct. It's all fascinating, it's all wonderful. And Anna de Armas's performance has such sublime delicacy that kept me immersed all throughout. And I felt so invested in her relationship with Ryan Gosling's character. I just could not take it just because of how much emotion I was going through on the span of it. And that's how I felt just all the way throughout between the brilliant direction, the incredible cinematography, the very, very strong story, the incredible acting, all of that. It still stayed with me and it still stays with me even to the end of this time. And you will bet 
And you will probably win that I will buy this movie immediately when it comes out and I will watch that one like crazy. And with that, that is why Blade Runner 2049 is the best movie of 2017. <sighs> that was exhausting, but you know what? Absolutely worth it. And you know why? Because it does pay to go back and really look at how far we come in our, in our filmmaking culture to actually make such wonderful work. And I can't even begin to fathom where we're going to go from here. I mean, I suppose one of the reasons we rely so much on franchise films like, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Star Wars is because they're reliable tent poles to just give us something to look forward to. And then we can wind up being surprised with everything else that comes after. And so with that, I pull the curtains on 2017. And for more addictive content on Narcotic Casserole in the year 2018, simply like, share, subscribe, click, thou shalt be served.